What's up, everybody? Welcome to Theology in the Dirt. We want to practice our theology in the public square of our homes, our city, and our world. We record Theology in the Dirt from Global Impact Restoration Rome, where we work to address the foster care and adoption crisis in northwest Georgia, Georgia, the southeast, and the world as we practice our theology in the public square. You can check out Restoration Rome by going to restorationrome.org. You can also get sermon updates, notes, and links to the rest of our podcast at theologyinthedirt.com. My name is Mitchell Jolly. And I'm Chris Hayes. How about we get to some news? Well, Chris, the uh, Qatari foreign minister announced Monday that Israel and Hamas would extend an internationally brokered temporary ceasefire until Thursday morning as 11 more Israeli hostages held by Hamas, all women and children, including three-year-old twins and 33 Palestinian prisoners charged or convicted of violent crimes in Israel were released Monday as part of the existing deal. The extended agreement could allow for the release of at least 20 more Israeli hostages, with Israel continuing to release three prisoners for every one hostage freed, as well as permit additional humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip. And then tech billionaire Elon Musk visited Israel on Monday. He toured the sites of the October 7 Hamas massacre of Israelis alongside Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The ex-owner, ex-formerly known as Twitter, and I still call it Twitter, uh, the ex-owner sparked outrage earlier this month when he seemed to endorse anti-Semitic speech, prompting a significant exodus of major advertisers like IBM and Apple from his social media platform. Musk, the richest man in the world, owns important technologies like internet service provider Starlink, which makes him a key ally for world leaders. It was jarring to see the scene of the massacre Musk told Netanyahu during the visit. And then a Defense Department spokesman said Monday that initial reports suggest the five individuals who attacked a commercial vessel in the Gulf of Aden over the weekend were Somali pirates. The USS Mason, a U.S. Navy destroyer, and other nearby allied ships responded to the cargo ship's distress calls and forced the five attackers to flee before they were caught and taken aboard the destroyer. Two and a half hours later, Houthi rebels fired ballistic missiles from Yemen in the Mason's direction. And though the missiles fell well short, it's yet unclear if the ship was even intended, the intended target of the attack. And my final piece of news is the Argentine president-elect Javier Millet, I think that's how you pronounce his name, will be in Washington, D.C. today. He's a fascinating figure if you haven't heard him be interviewed yet, to meet with representatives of the International Monetary Fund, of which his country is the top debtor. Millet is also set to meet with several Biden administration officials, including National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, But not with Biden himself as the president, this is another piece of news, will be traveling to Atlanta to attend the memorial service for former First Lady Rosalind Carter. Um, Malai, a libertarian economist and political outsider, was a uh, won won a presidential runoff earlier this month. He was in New York City on Monday where he had lunch with former President Bill Clinton and visited the grave of Kabad Lubavitch. Kabad Lubavitch. Boy, there's a... There's one. Hook it on Pahonics working for me. (laughs) (laughs) He was a movement leader uh, and uh, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson in Queens. And that is my news. Some unfortunate names in there. Yeah, yeah, I should have practiced those probably a little more. (laughs) Unsurprisingly, Americans set a new spending record on Black Friday this year, spending around $16.4 billion, a 9% increase from last year, according to Salesforce. On Thanksgiving Day, Americans spent around $5.5 billion, which is also an increase of about 7.5% from last year. Um, that shouldn't shock anyone. Yeah. We spend a lot of money on those days. We do. More and more states are pushing to legalize sports gambling. Uh, already 37 of 50 states plus Washington, D.C. have legalized sports gambling. Several states, including Georgia, have recently introduced legislation but have not seen it pass. Mm-hmm. And there are five states currently who have no current legislation, including California, Alaska, Alabama, Utah, and Idaho. However, the expectation is that in 2024, there will be more states submitting legislation and looking to get it legalized in their states after seeing the success other states have had. And then finally, seven senators and 31 representatives are leaving U.S. Congress and not seeking re-election, the highest number in over a decade. Uh, Reportedly, according to some of the lawmakers in Congress, the uptick in departures 
is a perfect storm of recent chaos, longstanding frustrations, and expected retirements. Mm -hmm. While this is probably good news overall, as I think most everyone agrees, people in Congress should not be there nearly as long as they are. Right. This is probably more chaos to come with who takes those empty spots, and more than likely the people leaving are the smarter ones who are like, I don't want to be in this, than the ones who are there just for the power and the notoriety. So right. my faith in this being a positive thing is pretty low. Mm. <laughs> but we'll see. What happens. Yeah, perhaps it could be. To clarify, positive. my faith in anything out of Washington D.C. is pretty low. <laughs> it's pretty, and, that, and that's yeah. not a that's not a party thing. That's in general. Yeah, that's all across the board. It's all across the board. Yeah, I completely agree. It, uh, uh, just a little commentary on the news. I'm 100 percent convinced it's really not a two party system. It's a uniparty with two different flavors in order to ensure continued control. That's why Robert Kennedy is an outsider, and that's why they haven't granted him Secret Service um, detail, which is unprecedented. And uh, anyway, I'm going to get into trouble if I go any further. So, you got any more news? <laughs> No. Okay, good. <laughs> Otherwise, I might start commenting on the news rather than just dropping some stuff. You know? True. Why don't you tell us about our sponsor? Yeah, let's talk, talk about Magic Mind. Um, let's remind our Theology of the Dirt listeners about an absolutely amazing product. And if you want a all-natural, gluten-free, sugar-free, keto, vegan, and paleo-friendly, incredible help to help increase your focus and your energy, you need to try Magic Mind. Key ingredients like lion's mane mushrooms that are absolutely amazing – uh, at an anti-inflammatory help uh, contains adaptogens that reduce anxiety and improve cognition uh, helps reduce neural degeneration um, if you want all that amazing stuff you can find that in magic mind and the problem uh, that was ran into by its founder james uh, bashara who was a, a in the tech industry, um, was diagnosed with a heart condition. His doctor explained two major culprits were too much stress and too much caffeine. Uh, he was running a company, uh, needed some help. The doctor told him he needed to limit his caffeine intake to about a half a cup of coffee a day. Uh, his doc suggested green tea because it has compounds in it that helped the absorption of the caffeine uh, work longer into the day. That helped keep calm while keeping him alert. It had never occurred to him that adding some ingredients to that caffeine would increase its effectiveness and decrease stress. So with a decade worth of research into uh, the world of nootropics and adaptogens and functional mushrooms, over 100 iterations later, he came up with Magic Mind. It's scientifically designed to boost energy, enhance focus, and create a sense of calm alertness and increase overall productivity. I absolutely enjoying Magic Mind, uh, and I think you guys will too. I think you would love it. I wish you'd give it a try. Magic Mind increased my energy and focus longer into the day. I feel more focused and just simply feel good from the benefits, and I'm grateful for an all-natural help um, to help increase longevity in my day and my focus and my effectiveness. You can get it at magicmind.com forward slash theology in the dirt with the code TID20. You also get up to 56% off your first subscription or 20% off your one-time purchase. The promo code, again, is TID20 for 56% off. It also works if you're already a subscriber because you can save on your next subscription payment. Magic Mind is a 100% money-back guarantee. No questions asked. There's really no risk to you. If you don't like it, they refund in three to four hours. I really like it. I think you will, too. Again, the link is magicmind.com forward slash theology to dirt. Promo code is TID20 for up to 56% off your subscription. The 30-pack is the best value. You should give it a try. Chris, let's get theology in the dirt. Do it. Well, today we want to uh, we want to dive into um, the issue of worship. Um, this is an important issue for me. It's a, a issue. Issue is the wrong word. Um, that's a terrible word. It's not an issue. This is an important topic for yeah. me, and I would say the reason it's an important topic for me is because, um, frankly, it is uh, it is probably what's at stake uh, in the whole core of the narrative of scripture. 
Um, we have a story in our Bible. <clears throat> and when I say story, I want people who hear this. If you're a Christian, you know what I'm saying. If you're not a Christian and you stumbled upon this and you're listening to this, don't hear story equal myth equal made up thing. Hear uh, historical narrative. Hear um, the relaying of reality. So when I say story, I mean it's put in narrative form for us to read. It's not just a bunch of facts that are that are dotted. It's a it's a narrative that's been put together. It's been captured for us in the Bible, um, in history, in time and space. And what you find in that is from creation up to a certain point in time. A man enjoyed unhindered fellowship with the Lord. In fact, the language of the scriptures uh, tell us that they enjoyed walking with the Lord in his physical form, which we believe to be the incarnate, eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ, Mm -hmm. in the garden, in the cool of the day. And they walked with him. And the the seraph, the serpent, the fiery one, appeared. Um, there's There's been a rebellion. Somewhere, somehow... The seraph, the serpent, didn't like God's plan uh, to have humans be co-regents, particularly when we learn in Hebrews that man was made a little lower than the angels. So here are these heavenly beings who are who are higher in, in their whatever it is they possess. They this amazing supernatural capacity. We carry flesh. And but we're made in, in the Lord's image. And they don't like this plan. And so we know they don't like this plan because the attempt is to rob mankind, humans, of this beautiful vision of Genesis 1, 26 to 28, of with the Lord, on mission, in fellowship with him, unbroken, unhindered, unfettered, subduing all of created order. What a glorious thing. So it, did he really say? I mean, can you really trust him? And boom, at that moment, our parents fell. They fell and they distrusted the Lord, and that fellowship with God was broken. And so the Lord set in motion his eternal plan um, to redeem back to himself humans and restore Eden, um, and that plan's not complete yet. And so what is at stake in that is this, is this communion with God, this fellowship with God that is clearly presented in passages we'll cover in a moment, like Romans 12, 1 that's what worship is. Um, I think, unfortunately for a lot of us, we, we were raised or came up during the time of worship wars, and worship wars are, um, is it contemporary? Uh, is it liturgical? Like Words that are foreign to the Bible, completely foreign to the Bible. Yeah. None of the language is in the Scriptures. And, so, and, and what we've done is equated worship to a one-hour or however long a worship service is, uh, a, a one-hour segment of time on a particular day, um, and f- and even had debate on how to do it. Never asked the question: Was is that really the essence of worship? Is that what worship is? And so, what we want to do is we want to address that because I, I what what I believe again I said at the beginning it, this is I think everything in the Bible hinges on the restoration of this relationship, this fellowship with God. And what I would argue is. That is what worship is. It's that. Um, it's continual. It's ongoing. It isn't segmented to a time during the week. It's an ongoing reality. Now, I got introduced to this um, uh, when I was in seminary. A guy named Dr. Bruce Leafblad. He ruined me and Jennifer for worship. We both had had a Leafblad. Um, I'll never be able to repay Dr. Leaf. He's passed on. He's with the Lord. Um, he he knows uh, in person what this looks like better than anybody right now. He was a faithful uh, ex expositor of the scriptures. What I loved about him, he wasn't just a music guy. He had his PhD in theology, and he was an expert in the languages. And he had a, also, I think, he had a doctorate in church music. He was a brilliant man, but he had practice too. He he was a Ray Ortland Senior. He he and Ray Ortland Senior worked together. Um, he was a worship pastor. Ray Ortland Senior was was the was the preacher. I just he has a pedigree of working in the local church. It's not like he's just a scholar in an ivory tower. Dr. Leafblad worked this stuff out in the local church in fellowship. Um, people didn't like Leafblad because he was sort of stoic. Uh, and he was he was tough. His class was difficult. 
Um, you, you took that class. Some people took that class even at a master's level, thinking, "Oh, I'm gonna, this is going to be an easy class, so I can focus on writing my theology papers." You got into leaf blad, and it was work. Yeah, it was a lot of work. I still have my notebook in there on my shelf. I'll show you my leaf blad notebook. I still reference it. It's it might have been the most influential class I had because we had to use languages. He made us use the languages, particularly us theology students who were in Greek and Hebrew, and then learning some Aramaic and other stuff on the. We he made us use languages. It was a hard class. Um, it wasn't a cakewalk. It was a master's level class. It was supposed to be a challenge. But his class on worship um, challenged my definition, um, number one, because I had a poor definition that I couldn't even articulate. I just had ideas. And if you asked me, I would maybe spit them out at you and, and some bullet points. He challenged that, and he ruined me for the ordinary. So it, it makes me ask this question, where do we start when we're going to talk about worship? Well, I think we start at Romans 12.1. Paul says this, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. So the question I I, I want to ask to set up how we want to break this down a little bit, uh, because I'm going to give you the definition that Leif Blad gave us that still still I use today, and we've used as a church. Yeah. You've been around long enough to know the hand, hand motions. motions and everything. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So why not just use Romans 12.1 as the definition of worship? Well, the primary reason is that sentence, Romans 12.1, uh, is a summary of 11 chapters of writing about the justifying work of Jesus' sacrifice. So his summary of that 11 chapters on the justifying work of the cross uh, is an application. And it's the introductory application to four more chapters on what it looks like to actually worship. So Romans, if, if you really want to break Romans down, it's 11 chapters on the work of the cross and what it accomplishes. And then 12.1 is the introductory sentence to four chapters of what it looks like, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, five chapters, of so counting chapter 12. So five chapters of what it actually looks like to live a life of worship. And so why not just <laughs> use all the book of Romans? That's a lot. And so, and so Leafblad didn't use that because we needed to find a way to summarize because Romans is a snapshot of worship being at the center, the reason we worship and what that worship looks like. And so what Paul's capturing in Romans is a snapshot and a large snapshot, a, a satellite snapshot of what worship is. And so what we needed to do was find a way to encapsulate that in one single sentence. And so I think that's what Dr. Leafblad was trying to do with that definition that we're going to share in just a moment. The work of salvation and my life as worship in response to that. I think that that would be, if you ask him, why did we come up with this definition? Why did he come up with this? And it would be to capture the work of salvation in our lives as worship in response to that work. So here's the definition. And then, uh, Chris, I'm about to shut up, I promise. So, worship is communion with God in which believers by grace center their minds' attention and hearts' affection on the Lord, humbly glorifying God in response to the revelation of His glory and His majesty. That's Dr. Bruce Leafblad. Now, we're going to break this into four parts. Mm -hmm. Today, we're going to kind of do a comprehensive in which is what we're doing now, some comprehension, big picture, and then we're going to jump into communion with God. But... The next time we're together, we're going to talk about the other part of that, communion with God in which believers by grace center their minds, attention, hearts, affection on the Lord. Then we're going to talk about humbly glorifying God. Then we're going to talk about what it is to respond to the revelation of His glory and His majesty. And so communion with God. Worship is communion with God. What is this? Um, Communion is one way um, of saying Mm -hmm. co-union. and it makes us ask the question, then what is union with Christ? If, if I have communion with God, and communion is co-union, it's communing with, it's having union with Christ, what exactly is that? So, Chris, what do you think? What is communion that we have with Christ, communion with God? By the way, when we say communion with God, we mean the triune God of the Bible. So you can put communion with Jesus, communion with the Holy Spirit, because that's one God, three distinct persons. So we're, we're saying the same thing there, right? So we all right. understand. When we say God, we mean Jesus. Yes. Right. All right. So, what do you think? Well, because I, I think, well, start. I think the triune God is they're in communion with each other yes. at all times, and that yeah. that's where we start. But yeah. uh, communion is God's communication to us, coupled with our response to Him, all in such a way that He's glorified and we're glad. Um, mm. Oh, say that again. So, communion is God's communication to us, 
coupled with our response to him, all in such a way that he's glorified and we're glad. God, that's a little John Piper. I wish I could take credit for all, all that there because it's well written. But so um, rich, I feel like yeah. that's fudge. You know, like you just chew bite into a nice piece yeah. of fudge. You don't want to savor it. That's true. That's beautiful. You've just heard communion and worship compared to fudge. Just for those who are <laughs> keeping track at home. But no, you're right. That's a good because it, it's it's savory. It is savory. It, um, and I think it's important. And I think I like that you brought up Romans. I'm diverging here a little bit because Romans. It's really set up that way, like you said. I mean, it's eleven chapters of this is the gospel, and then the response to that is worship. It's not because yeah. if if you don't understand that, then your worship, what are you worshiping and why? Right. And I, and so I say that because I think that bleeds into a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Mm. Mm. Um, communion assumes that God comes to us in love and that we respond joyfully to the beauty of His perfections and the offer of His fellowship. So it's, it's built upon relationship. Mm. It's how we were made to function and ultimately about a loving and a very present relationship with the triune creator. Mm. Um, I love Psalms 43, 3 and 4. Uh, Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. So that that, that kind of verse, there's, there's that connection, there's that relationship. Bring me to where you are. Let me be with you, and I will go to that altar, and then I will worship with you. Um, it's the very purpose we were made for. It's connection, it's worship, it's joy, intimacy, and oneness, all kind of all bundled together. Wow. Yeah, uh, It's why worship is more than singing songs or simply taking bread and juice. Because we use that word communion a lot when we talk yeah. about the Lord's Supper. Like that's, yeah. and, and so that's not what we're talking about today, although that is a component yeah. of it. it and, and that's one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons that language is used in regard to the Lord's Supper, communion. It, it is a, we, what we're saying in that act is that we are communing, we are, have, we are expressing our union with Jesus. Yeah, because Jesus said, and Jesus said, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. Right. And so, if, if there isn't, if there is not, um, yeah, it, it, we. So that's why we call it communion. It's like you're right. That language gets lost on us. We just we we're having communion. But no, what we're doing is we're expressing physically, um, in a physical act, we're we're putting on display this gospel that is the broken body and spilled blood of the eternal preexistent son of God, Jesus Christ. And and in doing that, we are declaring we have communion with him, which is why Corinthians will say, like, if you don't do this unworthily, you, you need to eva- evaluate yourselves, examine yourselves, because if you don't, he flat out says that you eat and drink judgment on yourselves. Whew. Yeah. That's how that's how much communion with God, that's how significant it is, is we, we evaluate that and take that seriously, or we flip it with it and it makes us sick. Absolutely. And I don't want to get into too much of what we're going to talk about next week when we, we talk about kind of centering our minds, attention, and our hearts, affection on the Lord. Mm-hmm. But I think to hit on that really quickly is important for this communion piece because it's a centering of all of us. It's not only an emotional response. Yeah. But it's also not just an intellectual piece. Yes. But but you have to have both. That's right. And and it's so it's it's all of our being. Um, it's why Romans 12.1 is a great definition, and what, but yeah. while we're also talking through it this way, but it is, it's a centering of all, of everything we are on him and with him. Mm. And so that, that oneness, that togetherness, it, it reminds us that uh, even in our darkest moments, he is near and working for our good, and we have reason to rejoice even when nothing in us feels like rejoicing. Mm. And so kind of what I want to focus on, I've got, there's kind of like two questions I want to hammer in on today when we talk about communion with God. And to lead up to the first one, um, when I think about communion with God, it's it's quite an unbelievable possibility. When we consider, okay, he cre- created billions of galaxies. He knows all the stars by name. He's made everything in our world, including every person. He knows everything about everyone. He has no beginning and no end. And then on top of all that, we're in rebellion against him and our children of his wrath and dead in our sins and trespasses before Jesus. So that leads me to my first question. How is communion even possible? And, and my answer is that, number one, it's for his glory and our joy. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we talked about the, was it the um, Westminster Catechism, uh, the confession, yeah, right? Yeah. The, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Yeah. And I've heard so many yeah. sermons and, and re- read so many things on that, on why that importance of that and in that sentence. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's bad subject verb agreement. 
It's yeah. like chief end is, but it lists two things. Right. And, and that's because they are both equally the same thing. It's the same thing. And, <laughs> that's they, right, and they yeah. happen at the same time. That's right. So it's for his glory and our joy. Glorifying yeah. God is not something we do after communing with him, yeah. but by communing with him. Mm. Uh, many human deeds magnify the glory of God's goodness, but only if they flow from our contentment in communion with him. Mm. Uh, that's why we pray at a Psalm 90, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Mm. Uh, the joy of this communion and the love of God confirms God's worth and it shows his glory. Uh, communion with God may come with discipline and hardship and struggles, uh, but it can never destroy our joy because communion with him is our joy. Mm-hmm. And, and I know yeah. that that feels wrong. I, I'm not going to take us into some deep places today, but I think back of that and I'm like, and is that true? Because there's times I felt like my joy was destroyed, mm. but, I, but that's not true because it can't be destroyed mm. because it is absolutely part of communion with him. When we are in Christ, yeah. that is there. Um, mm. And I love how Piper answers the question of how can we possibly have communion with God? He says, the answer of the Bible is that God himself took the initiative to be reconciled to his enemies. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place and bear the curse that we deserved from God. Uh, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, Galatians 3. So the wrath of God that we deserved fell on Christ, Isaiah 53. And because God gave Christ as our substitute, we can be reconciled to him and enjoy peaceful communion with him. Wow. Um, so that's kind of the first question. Question number two is, why is this hard for us? Mm. Why is communion hard for us? And, and if, if, we, if you're saying it's not hard for you, we'd like <laughs> to talk to you and find out your secrets. Because I... <laughs> And I don't mean all the time hard, but there are times it's hard. Yeah, absolutely. And the answer is sin. Uh, it's, mm. a, it's a simple simple answer to a simple question, or to a complicated question, I should say. Right. Our sin and the sin in the world destroy communion and drive us to flee from God. Uh, the brokenness affects every part of us, including, and especially really, our relationship with God. In his divine presence, we inevitably see our sin, but we also discover the depth of his grace and the mm. incredible truth that he desires to be with us. Uh, he desires communion with us so much, as Romans 5 points out, that he died in order to make it possible. Because God gave Christ as our substitute, we can be reconciled to God and enjoy peaceful communion with him. Uh, Romans 5, again, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. And then uh, also, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this peace leads us to the unparalleled joy of communion with God. Uh, Romans 5 really pours that out well. But it is our sin... Our sin separates us, right? So our, we, we talk about, we know that's what it means. Sin is separation from God. And when we are in sin, even as believers, that is pulling us away. It's pulling us from that communion. The Lord's seeking that, wants that. We know we want that, but our sin pulls us away. Yeah. And so communion is really about that effort to get past that, understanding that grace, the yeah. power of that grace. And that's where I think communion leads into worship. Because if we truly yeah. understand the fact that, man, I'm literally running from him. Yeah. Daily, yeah. I'm, I'm, my my nature is pulling me from him, but he still pursues. He he sees all that. He knows all that. Forgives that. Paid for that. Yeah. Paid for the penalty for that every time he did that once, and it was good enough for all those times. And then I run back to him. Yeah. And that's that's that worship. Yes. Yeah. And why it ties in. That's good. I <clears throat> I think that tension you're talking about there, Paul expresses in Romans seven so clearly. Um, because communion has been established. Like if we are in Christ, we are, and, and I'll just use the language, it's so common to us to say in Christ, if we ever believe the gospel, repent of sin, and receive the Holy Spirit through repentance and faith, that he's given us his spirit, given us a new heart, our sins have been forgiven. Past, present, future, done, wiped away. And at the same time, we still live uh, in this world in a human body that hasn't been fully redeemed yet. We have a new heart with a new set of desires. We have the Holy Spirit, and yet we have a component of us that fights back against that. And and without that intentional effort to receive and live in and access the joy that can't be destroyed, but to access it is a different discipline. Yes. It's not just... It doesn't just happen. I wish it did. Right. I wish it did. It doesn't. There is a component of seeking it out. Jeremiah 29, everybody knows 29, 11, but they don't usually quote verse 12 and 13. If you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me. It's not like God's hiding, yeah. but, but there's a component of when he means find him, it's not like hiding behind a rock. What, what, what the language in, implies is that by seeking him, we experience him. 
I'm going to talk about this in, in just a little bit. Revelation 3.20, which gets totally abused for evangelism. It's horrible how it gets used, but it's an invitation to already believers to have fellowship with the Lord, and it's an invitation, meaning I have to receive it new. Not salvation, I'm saved, but communion, fellowship. It's something I have to I have to receive from the Lord and intentionally engage in. Yeah. And so um so communion with God is available. And there there are there are roadblocks to it. <laughs> and so the availability for us, the door's been opened. The key has unlocked the door. We have access. Mm-hmm. That's salvation. The experience of it is a discipline of walking through that door and 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 the sin, the things that keep us from that communion, which which is the essence and heart of what worship is. We'll say this. We'll, we'll probably there's just so many. We'll come back to this over and over again. But it's, um, it's going through that door and living in that that leads to quality corporate experience. In that time that we set aside to gather together, does that make sense? Yes. Um, and, and the crazy thing is, you, we as humans can manufacture. Um, we can manufacture an environment that manipulates something that isn't real. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like yeah. an emotional experience alone is not necessarily worship. Um, and um, that doesn't mean it's absent of emotion either. Um, but there's so much more to it than a manipulated response of the human psyche to something. Um, it, it is the human response to the Lord. And and often this is where worship gets tricky is we can set ourselves. This is where we just talked about idolatry on Sunday. We can put the event and our methodologies in the place of God and pull that out of people, and people think they're worshiping the Lord, and what they're doing is just being manipulated. Um, so we have to be careful. And, and we need to talk about that is how do we put ourselves in a position to facilitate people experiencing the Lord, not experiencing us. That's huge. Well, I think, so having a little bit different perspective on that as a worship leader, I think that's that's part of, I guess, growth too. Because there are things I can do musically to manipulate that response. Right. And I think there's times where that's okay to do, and this is going to sound weird, so let me, let me explain that. Mm-hmm. Not intentionally manipulate people. What it is is there's there's – tools and things I can do to help stir up that emotional yeah. response that's, that should already be there. Yeah. And I think that's the big difference there is yeah. rather, cause you can have, a, I mean, I go to a Georgia game and I have an emotional response or a Braves game, right? I'm having I, one right now. You, and you just a, said it. You I'm went <laughs> to a need to breathe concert recently, which I'm jealous of. I'm, you probably had an emotional response. Yes. Uh, when I listened to, cause music is made that way and yes. it's made that way as a tool to yes. stir up the emotional response in us for worship. 100%. And we could probably spend a couple of episodes on that too if we wanted to, but I think that's an important piece. And I wanted to bring up, because I know we're going to get in a couple weeks when we get to part four, we'll talk about that last part in response to the revelation of the glory. But I think, and I don't know if Lee Blad intended this or not because I didn't have a class with him, so I'm jealous of that. But that revelation piece I almost think is not a one-time thing. I think that that's a, probably a daily, a daily or an often occurrence. It's not that it's, something that's new every time, yeah. but that revelation of re- maybe it's realization is a better word. Mm. I know for me it is. I'm like, yeah. I need to, I have to realize that over and over. I have to realize and recognize yeah. that he's there yeah. in the midst of certain things. And I respond in worship because yeah. of that. And I, and I, that revelation of his glory and majesty is what spurs that on. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like I'm, I'm emotional. You said that and it stirred my heart because that's one of the reasons I, just dog people. I know people get so sick of it. It's like, God, all he tells me to do is read my dang Bible. I'm so tired of him telling me to read the Bible. What's it going to do for me? Well, the reason behind that is that's where you will meet him. Uh, if you do that on a daily basis, and sometimes it's not going to be, it's not always going to be giggles and good vibes only. There will be times you're going to meet the Lord in those Genesis uh, moments with Jacob where you wrestle because he says things that you don't want to hear but you still saw him <laughs> and, and it brings you to a place that that brings you to the place of worship being lament, uh, being questions, being darkness, 
you know, Genesis 15, the Lord, when he made the covenant with Abraham, a deep darkness descended on Abraham, not a, a light fluffy. And he, and he, and he went into this moment where there's a deep darkness there. And so the Lord is in the dark as well as the light. And I don't mean that good and evil. I mean, and hard and easy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yes, yes. I mean, it's a daily revelation reminder of who he is and, and meeting with him. Because he's inviting us into the garden, back to that moment where we walk with him. Um. And, and the Lord introduced us to this. It's not, Paul didn't come up with this. Paul's preaching from the Lord's words. The Lord gave us the Old Testament. And the Lord incarnated and took on flesh and dwelt among us so we could see his glory. Um, he said, John 15, he talked about abiding in him. Abide, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me. Um, the, the Lord even said it um, in John 14, 20. On that day, you'll realize that I'm in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. I mean, he said these things. Abide in me. Dwell in me. You're going to realize it in this day, and Jesus is talking about the giving of the Holy Spirit. You're going to realize I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me, and now I, and he's going to say later, we, us, we are in you. And so this language of in Christ comes from the Lord Jesus himself as he talks about what he's doing in his work of salvation. He's restoring us, and, and he's making it possible for us to dwell in, be in communion with, be in fellowship, have the garden restored, uh, to us again. So when Paul picks up on this kind of stuff, he he makes it such a key component. I, I think it's a centerpiece of his theology, frankly. So much, and this is not bad, I'm not poo-pooing on this, but because of the Reformation, we come back to justification as the centerpiece of Pauline theology. And I don't know that it is. I know this is debatable. Please feel free to rebuke me, but I think justification is is a entrance into the centerpiece of Paul's theology. Because you look at Ephesians, um, you put... Put, look at Colossians. You're going to find that dominant theme, particularly in in Ephesians. In Christ is absolutely the theme of of his writing in Ephesians, and it's particularly evident in chapter one, verse three to fourteen, where the phrase or a variant of that phrase in Christ occurs some eleven different times. Um, those in Christ um, uh, are in thought uh, and eternal purpose of God. One, three, four, nine, eleven. Chapter two, verse six. Verse 10 in chapters 3, 9 to 11, he talks about the saints are elect in Christ. Um, the blessings of redemption are restored by God in Christ. Um, elsewhere, he's going to come back. He's talking about Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. He's going to use this phrase to describe the mode of existence in which believers identify with the death and resurrection of Christ. They share his wisdom and his holiness um, and receive a whole new life and existence. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So to be in Christ is to begin to experience what was promised in Isaiah and is promised at the end of Revelation. We are the first fruits of a whole new created order. That, yeah. I mean, that opens a can of theological worms we don't have time to get to now, but to experience salvation and communion with God is to live in the first little shoots of the plant coming out of the ground of new creation. And so what we are now is only a taste of what we're going to be and what all of creation is going to be as he restores it upon his return. Like that, like that's insane. And we have access to that to commune with him in that. that I almost feel like we don't have language for that. Like, like that's just kind of something that's got to sit in your soul and begin to birth, birth some stuff. And I, and I truly think part of our accessing that joy that can't be killed is thinking on those things. Well, and I and I man, I love that. I could, we could pack that in yeah. part for hours because that's such a crucial. Because, well, it, to put that in other words, relationship defines identity. Yes, in that piece. And I, I mean, even in the simplest terms, one of the most important assets of the creation of Facebook that Mark Zuckerberg put in was adding that piece in a relationship with, mm. right? And the very like that was one of the big separators from what MySpace was to what Facebook was going to be. It was about relationship status. Why? Because that's who you identify with. Now, yeah. granted, that that was more about who you were sleeping with in college. That's, <laughs> so I'm not, it's not the best thing. <laughs> but when I but I think about it, and I had this yeah. conversation with somebody the other day because I was like, when somebody's like, you know, how does it feel? We asked, oh, they're like, oh, I'm sorry, how are you? After they'd asked me about how Brittany and Addison were. And, I, and they were like, oh, I'm sorry. And I said, no, don't be sorry. I said, like, that's part of my identity is, I'm Brittany's husband. Yeah. And I'm Addison's father. Yeah. 
And that is that is a core component of who I am. Yeah. And who we relate with is who we are, who we spend our, yeah, our right. time with. It is is. And so taking that back to this component of understanding what communion is, it is it's, it's that in Christ component. Yes. It's not just because when we, when we try to visualize the word with, that almost feels like a little bit separate. It's not, but it, it's next to, right, yeah. or, or like in the same area. All right. But in implies oneness. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's right. And, and dude, you're talking about, and, and this is where um, good Christians doing good soul work, um, like Dr. Kurt Thompson uh, identifies you know the soul map right or, or the the self map you know, some people call it the self map it's a key component of the study of the human soul which by the way psychology is the study of the soul so um, pagans have taken God's terminology the study of the soul and turned it into the study of the biome <laughs> that's not what it is uh, it's the study of, of the human identity uh, meshed with this biome and you talk about a self map. Like you, you are like Brittany is right at the center of who you are because you're one flesh. And so you are identified. And so this idea of identifying with Christ in communion is to take into the core of who we are. Our identity is Jesus's. I'm his property. And I mean that in as every positive way we can possibly mean it. And so it is, it's that issue. And so when we become Christians, our self map shifts. Yeah. We are now in, and he is part of which, which should, should, Create an emotive response, which, by the way, this is why this is why it is an emo. There is emotion involved. Which, going back to and this was huge as, as you were saying this. This is this is why properly placed tools like music, which em, which evoke a proper emotional response, happen not in isolation, but in an order intended to use that intended creative purpose to funnel it in the right direction. It, that makes sense. Yeah. This is why it's it's not just this is why it's important that there is a service. Why we say worship service, it's a liturgy, it's an order. And those things are placed there in order to prevent them from being misused, but to use them properly to focus our emotive responses in the right direction. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a it's a channel or, yes. or a tool. Yeah. One of of several, not the only. That's right. That's right. It it might be the most prolific or the one we connect yeah. to most, and I think that's okay. Yeah, it's just not the end all. Well, we'll talk about um, we'll talk about this as as we move along, also, um, because we're talking about in response. And yeah. We'll talk about Isaiah six. Our our liturgy is based on Isaiah six. Our our order of service at our churches is, is predicated on this definition that, and Isaiah six is order of seeing the Lord and His response to the Lord, and so when put in the right order. Um, even a call to worship announcements um, are an invitation to see something that is set in the setting of the kingdom of God and respond to it as an act of my communion with the Lord so that even dumb things like announcements are not unimportant and they're not just to inform people but they're intended as a flow of people in the kingdom of God, covenanted fellowship on mission together, are seeing things that are important and part of the kingdom of God, which is why we try to stay narrow, so that everything we do is in line with the kingdom of God. So even when we responded to, to simple things like announcements, we're responding to an invitation to intimacy and fellowship with the Lord that makes us in fellowship with other people. And so that's on purpose. It's not. This is why we guard it hard. Yeah. We're kind of mean about it. Is is like what mattered. This is an issue of our worship of the Lord. And so, and, and, and it's the last component I'll say here about communion and, and union with Christ is union with Christ is presented in Paul as not isolated from, but combined with other people. So he's going to specifically speak about this. He's talking about this to the Corinthians. He's talking about it to the Romans. Is what happens, he talks about in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, is because we're now in union with Christ, that automatically puts us in union with other people who are also in Christ. Thus, thus the bond of fellowship between humans. And I say humans who've been redeemed. Not every human, but humans who've been redeemed. Yeah. And thus, therefore, those who covenant together to be accountable to one another to the stewardship of that communion together, which is why church membership is vital to worship, is we're agreeing to you have a responsibility to make sure I don't violate that union with Christ with you and other people. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. And if I'm not committed to that, then I can't be part of you, practically speaking. Because I was like, who are you to tell me I'm supposed to treat my wife well? 
I'm not responsible to you. Well, you kind of are. I kind of am. You know what I mean? And so my agreement with that is the basis of church membership, and that's not disconnected from communion with Christ. It's not just this crazy thing we do called church. We make stuff up. It's rooted in the fact that we have a common union with Christ, and therefore we have a common goal, and that is the worship of the Lord Jesus. And and it, it's all. I mean, it's it's rich. It's thick. It's well, and it brings me to like. There's a reason. You know, I'm sure everybody listening has been to a wedding, right? There's a reason why the wedding up front is situated the way it is. Yeah. Right? You've got family on two sides. You've got this kind of triangle look up front yeah. of like relationships leading to the combining of two to make one with all the emphasis being on the bride and the bridegroom. Yep. And, and I, I think there, and this is why I, it just boggles on mine, the wedding weddings and even marriage of unbelievers. I'm yeah. like, he's just like, y'all have no idea what you're doing because it, what you're, what you're doing, what you're saying is not matching with its intention. Like yeah. there's a spiritual, there's a worship component of that, of becoming one. Yeah. Um, and reflecting that image yeah. of Christ and the bridegroom. Yeah, marriage, bridegroom. marriage, I say this, you know this, because we, we married you and Brittany, and you've heard, you heard this in the ceremony. It's the same ceremony we used. My wife wrote this, and I helped her write it for our wedding 24 years ago. And uh, we use it for every couple we marry in, in the life of the church. Um, we say this right at the very beginning. Com- marriage is the Lord's idea. It's from God. And, and, and the Lord pro- performs the first ceremony in Eden. Um, he gives the bride away to the groom. Um, and, and the model you just described is Genesis 15. It's the two halves of the covenant, and, 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 the, and the fire passes between the two halves and unites himself with, with Abraham. Oh, my God. Like it, and, and, and that's the basis of what a Christian wedding ceremony looks like. Therefore, marriage belongs to the Lord. It makes no sense for unbelievers to do a, a ceremony, a wedding. It, it's like... Just be like other pagans. Just join up. Just shack up. Get after it. Yeah. Whatever. But don't pretend like you're making a covenant with the Lord. Right. And by the way, I always say this to couples, and I say this in the ceremony. When you get married, you're not making a covenant with each other. That's not possible. You're making a covenant with God because it's His. Like marriage doesn't belong to me and you, me and Jennifer, so that we make a covenant with each other. It belongs to the Lord. We're making a covenant together with the Lord, which is why it's unbreakable. Right. And so... And, and and that's a communion issue, and so at the heart of a wedding is communion with God. Yeah, and that's absolutely just just massive. And so if if people don't understand, and I hope, I think they're hearing in this, and we're talking about worship, this is an infinitely deep issue because it's rooted in the infinite, eternal nature and character of God, who created us for His glory and our joy. Yeah, and we we experience that in communion, which is at the heart and the essence of what it is to worship the Lord. And so, if that doesn't blow your mind, then it's not blowable. That's true. Yeah. So, I, I, so we're going to start moving, moving toward the end here. So, what is communion with God? What's all the things we just said? <laughs> but let me try to summarize in a single sentence. A daily experience of personal fellowship with the God of the Bible because of salvation and for which we were created and which will fully be restored at the resurrection. Therefore... This requires discipline to engage the Lord in fellowship and respond to his invitation to fellowship. So if we're, in, if we're a Christian, we believe the gospel. Um, we've been united with Christ through the baptism work of the Holy Spirit, which, by the way, doesn't happen after salvation. It happens at salvation. Paul's clear about that. It's not a weird, crazy second thing. It happens at salvation. We get the Holy Spirit. He makes us a child of God, and we're united with Christ. And if we have that because of salvation— um, and we're experiencing that. This requires discipline for us to engage in. As we talked about earlier, we have a battle now. We're united with the Lord. We have a new heart. And there are stumbling blocks in the way that we have to discipline ourselves to get out of the way. And thus, Revelation 3.20, the Lord says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus, this is not an evangelism verse. He's talking to the church. And in talking to the church, he's inviting them to not be more of the church, he's inviting them into deeper intimacy with himself. So he's talking to the church. He's talking to people who already are his. And he says, I stand at the door knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in to him and eat with him and he with me. So is it possible for the Lord to speak to me and me not hear? Yeah. He probably is a lot more than, I, than I'm hearing. I'm standing at the door knocking. And jolly, you, you're cluttered. Too much noise. 
too many distractions, too many other things you're not paying attention. And so there's an invitation to experience practically. That's why I said a daily experience of personal fellowship with the God of the Bible is he's constantly inviting me to that experience. And he's knocking. The question isn't, is it available? The question is, what am I doing to access it? Because relationship's two-way street. If I'm in relationship with the Lord, I have a responsibility to exercise my will. And so that, that means to engage the Lord, it requires time and attention in the Bible, reading and in prayer and in silence and in solitude. I have to feed that. And the Lord knocks with an invitation to his people. And we're invited to respond for intimate fellowship with the Lord, not on just Sunday mornings, but in every moment of every single day. And living life in such a manner that I become constantly aware of that. There's actually a lot of good things happen in the Christian history before the Reformation. And one of those, one of those is called the daily office. And if you don't know what that is, you should read about it. Um, there's a way practically for you to make yourself aware of constant communion with the Lord. And you got to be willing to do it. It takes discipline. Yeah. Um, but it's possible. And if we do that, we can be healthier, more whole, um, and and probably experience a, more, a better, robust corporate worship. I need to stop talking. You have some ways to. Uh, Chris, why don't you close us out? Yeah, man. My takeaways for today are about how can we increase our communion with God on a regular basis? Uh, so number one, read his word. From Genesis to Revelation, God's words and deeds reveal God himself for our knowledge and our enjoyment. The mm-hmm. Bible is the only book with final authority that tells us what God did through Christ and how we must respond through faith to be saved and to enjoy communion with God. And uh, We must cultivate a hunger for his word, learn to read it, meditate it on it, and hide it within us. Um, number two, serve and love others. There's there's a deep connection between loving others and helping those in need with loving and knowing Christ. Uh, you know, Matthew 25, 34 to 40, Jesus reminds us that what we do for the least of these, we also did to him. Uh, James one twenty seven reminds us of that as well, as it talks about taking care of orphans and widows in their distress. So as, as God's love flows through us to others, I think we ourselves often grow in love for him mm. so that we can grow in communion with him by loving and serving others. Mm, that's good. Um, kind of an active component of that communion outwardly. Um, And that can also be part of that spiritual worship. Mm. Number three, pray boldly with humility and honesty. Um, Prayer is obviously the verbal way in which we communicate with God and connect to him in a very real relational way. And in prayer, we get to acknowledge his goodness and faithfulness and holiness. We confess our sins and humble ourselves. We thank him for his grace and mercy and his blessings. And we can ask him to meet our needs and those around us. We can cry when we're sad or mad. We can rejoice when we're happy. Mm. Uh, so prayer is important, but we can pray boldly, but we do that with humility and honesty. Uh, number four, communion with God isn't about feeling good or experiencing good things. And I think we hit on that a little bit today. It happens in our core. Job experienced it during his hardship. Daniel felt it in the lion's den. Jacob wrestled with God. Joseph understood it. Uh, don't think that hardship is a sign of separation, but embrace it as an opportunity for worship and communion with an almighty father who's right there in the dirt and mud with you every step of the way, will never leave you or forsake you. And then finally, number five, we remind ourselves daily that in our worship of in our communion with God, he gets the glory and we get the joy. God's the overflowing fountain. We're satisfied with the living water. He's infinitely rich and we are the happy heirs. There's no greater joy than making much of his name and glory. He gets no greater glory than from his children enjoying and delighting him. And it becomes this beautiful symphony between conductor and band, mm. creator and created. That's beautiful. That's enough said. There's a lot That's more good. we could There's say. A lot more. That's and, awesome. And we will say next. We will. Time. We'll say it next time. We'll continue to get into it. Guys, we really, really, really appreciate you guys listening to Theology in the Dirt, watching Theology in the Dirt, sharing Theology in the Dirt. And if you really want to help us out, give us a five star rating. Leave a comment. That would be very helpful. That always helps us to, to do better. Um, but we'd also uh, appreciate your feedback. You can send us an email at theologyinthedirt at gmail.com. If you got some suggestions for improvements we can make or topics you want us to talk about, send them to that email, and we will get after those. We are grateful for you. Again, check out magicmind.com forward slash theologyinthedirt, T-I-D-20 for the promo code, and you get 56% off. And uh, check us out next time. Y'all have a great day. See you soon. Out. Chalked it up to me when we were kids in Carolina.